Our scripture reading this evening is from John chapter 20. We read John 20 verses 1 through 25. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, while it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin which was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosesoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosesoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, 
I will not believe. And we end our scripture reading there. It should be evident to all of us that the four inspired gospel accounts with which our New Testaments begin all follow the same basic order. We have Christ's public ministry, his teaching and miracles, which leads us to his arrest, his trials, plural, his crucifixion, his death and his burial. Joseph of Arimathea's cave tomb just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And all four gospel accounts end the same with Christ's bodily resurrection. Though Mark and Luke go a step further at the very end of their accounts, concluding with a brief reference to the Lord's bodily ascension into heaven. This being the case, we need to ask why it is in this new series on John 20 and 21 that we are treating John's witness of Christ's resurrection and not Matthew's witness or Luke or Mark or even combining the four Gospels and sprinkling in the odd reference of 1 Corinthians or even the book of Acts. Well, without disparaging in any way the other three gospel accounts, there are several striking features of John's record that I'm going to state to you now. And through the series, you may recall these words later on. John's gospel, number one, gives us the longest account of Christ's resurrection appearances. In terms of chapters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have one chapter. John has two chapters. In terms of verses, Matthew and Mark, 20 verses. Luke, 53 verses, because Luke chapter 24 is a long one. And John has 56 John's witness to the resurrection is not only the longest, that's easy to prove, but it is also the most distinctive. There are some events only included in the fourth gospel. Chapter 20, beginning at verse 26, that meeting with the disciples, including Thomas, Nowhere else but John. The whole of John 21, only in John. And almost all the other scenes that John records, along with one or two other biblical penmen, even those, John gives us the longest account of each of those scenes in his own inimical style. For instance, our text this morning, John 20, verses 1 through 10. There are bits and pieces of that in the other Gospels, but John is long and more detailed and focuses on different elements. Next week's sermon, Lord willing, on verses 11 through 18, where Jesus meets with Mary Magdalene, highly distinctive in John. The longest account of Christ's resurrection appearances, the most distinctive. And in connection with that, third, John is an eyewitness to most of what he records in his last two chapters. Mark and Luke weren't eyewitnesses. Mark, we believe, was the pen man for Peter, who was an eyewitness. Luke, we're told, in the opening four verses of his gospel, researched thoroughly what he came later to write, all under divine inspiration. But only John and Mark were eyewitnesses. And John, unlike Matthew, 
the other eyewitness in the four gospel accounts, John, unlike Matthew, even refers in some detail to himself in these resurrection accounts. He refers to himself in the first sermon seen in this series, our text this morning, this evening, and in the last scene, John 21, as we'll see. It's worth also making at the beginning this fourth point, because we are going to return to it throughout the series. John, unlike the others, states his purpose. John's purpose statement applies to the whole gospel account he pens, but especially now to his witness to Christ's resurrection, in which section it is found. I'm referring to John 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So from John 1 all the way to John 21. But these are written, everything in the John, and now especially the last two chapters where this is found, the resurrection appearances of Christ. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing ye might have life through his name. That's the purpose for every reader of the gospel according to John and for us and especially through this series to believe in Jesus, to believe his bodily resurrection and in the way of that believing to receive more and more of everlasting life. That's the point. That's chiefly why John wrote these words, he tells us. John's witness then of Christ's resurrection is the longest and most distinctive because most of it was personally witnessed and it comes with a specific purpose that we believe in the risen Lord and receive more and more of his spiritual life. Moving on now to our text, the first 10 verses of John 20, we note that it is very vivid in its details. It gives the personal perspective of three persons. One woman, Mary Magdalene, and then two disciples, Peter and John, and it thereby provides lessons for us regarding faith in Jesus Christ an understanding of God's ways. Let's consider understanding Christ's empty tomb. And our three points are arranged person and response. Understanding Christ's empty tomb. Mary Magdalene, grave robbers. That was her response to the empty tomb. That's how she understood it. Peter Wondering in himself. Words taken from another gospel. And John believed. Understanding Christ's empty tomb. Mary Magdalene, grave robbers. That was her view. Peter, he wondered in himself. And John, John believed. Now all four gospel accounts begin their record of Christ's resurrection with the empty tomb. And they pay great attention to the time of its discovery. Three of the four gospel accounts tell us that these scenes took place after the Sabbath, after the Saturday. On that Saturday, Luke says, they rested, according, of course, to the fourth commandment. Matthew said the Sabbath was ended. Mark said it was past. 
All four Gospels then state that the empty tomb and Christ's resurrection took place on the first day of the week. That's the phrase. On the first day of the week, Matthew 28, verse 1. Mark 16, verse 2. Luke 24, verse 1. John 20, verse 1. And then they tell us, not only after the Sabbath and on the first day of the week, but all four indicate that it took place, the first events here, took place at the very start of that day. Very early in the morning, Mark and Luke. Yet dark, John. And with regard to the sun, Mark says the sun was rising. Matthew states it slightly differently. It began to dawn. And all of this raises the obvious question. Why all this specification of time? And even why the repetition after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, it's yet dark, the sun is rising and it's beginning to dawn. The Bible is here by indicating that something very important is about to happen. The witness of Christ's empty tomb, which is a sign of his bodily resurrection. It's worth noting that during Christ's public ministry, when he predicted his arrest, trial, and atoning cross, he would say, the Son of Man will rise on the third day, the third day after his crucifixion, the third day. Then when we move further in the gospel accounts to Christ's resurrection and the discovery of the empty tomb, the day referred to is the same, but the manner of its referral changes. The third day after his cross is now referred to as the first day of the week. So first of all, it's referred to from the day of the crucifixion, and then his resurrection is referred to with respect to the cycle of seven days, the first day of the week in all four gospel accounts as we have seen. The Spirit hereby is doing this, fixing clearly the day of Christ's resurrection because, and other scriptures will enforce this point even more strongly, there's going to be a change in the fourth commandment as to the day which is holy. There was a Saturday Sabbath in the Old Testament, the seventh day of the week, and now there's going to be a Sunday Sabbath or day of rest from the resurrection of Christ onwards. There are other grounds and reasons on the first day of the week. And even this phrase, occurring as it does at the start of the resurrection treatments of all four gospel accounts, the first day of the week, even this phrase is found elsewhere in the New Testament. Acts 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week at Troas in western Turkey, Paul preached and administered the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to the assembled church. On the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 tells us, when the church at Corinth was assembled, there was to be an offering to help poor, needy saints. And this phrase, the first day of the week, will actually occur again later in this series. And of course, there are other indications of New Testament worship for the church on Sunday in other places in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, which doesn't use first day of the week terminology. 
Who then came to the Lord's tomb very early on that first day of the week? The answer is several women. They were all women. There were no men. John tells us, as we read in the first verse of this chapter, Mary Magdalene. Matthew adds the other Mary. Mark adds Salome. Luke adds Joanna. So at least four women. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Salome and Joanna. But of these four, Mary Magdalene is the most emphasized. You'll probably have remembered this from your own Bible reading. In the, three, the first three gospel accounts that name more than one woman at the tomb, Mary Magdalene is always put first. And John, John only mentions one, that one being Mary Magdalene. This, of course, raises the question, if there were at least four women at the tomb, why does John only mention one, Mary Magdalene? Well, you may have noticed when we read verse 2 that Mary Magdalene, in her words to Simon Peter and the other disciple, John, says, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. There were more of us at the tomb. And then John mentions Mary Magdalene with clear focus and only her because in verses 11 through 18 he's going to dedicate eight verses to her meeting the risen Christ. And she is the one, apparently unlike the others, who goes to Peter and John, the beloved disciple, to tell them about this empty tomb. That's why John focuses on her and doesn't refer to the others. If we put the various accounts together, this is apparently what happened. The four or more women came early that Sunday morning in one or more parties in order to anoint the body of Jesus or to complete its anointing. According to verse 1, they see that the stone over the tomb has been removed. Verse 2 states, Then Mary Magdalene runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. And if you wonder why Mary Magdalene went to Peter and John, and not, let's say, some of the other followers of Jesus, Peter and John, of course, were amongst the 11 disciples. Peter and John were two of the three disciples who were especially close to Jesus during his ministry, the other being James. And there are several occasions where Peter, John, and James, that select group, go to be with Jesus or closer to Jesus, the raising of Jairus' daughter or in the Garden of Gethsemane, for instance. And then, too, Peter and John are not only prominent, not only leaders amongst the disciples, but they often function as a sort of pair. They're both mentioned at the Paschal meal in John 13. Both followed Jesus after his arrest, John 18. Both are found here in John 20. Both are treated together in John 21. Both of them are present at the healing of the man born lame in Acts 3 and 4. And the church sends Peter and John to Samaria to observe recent 
conversions in that city. Acts chapter 8. So Mary Magdalene goes for these two. What then did Mary Magdalene think had happened to Jesus' body? Who moved the stone? That's the question. Who moved the body? That's another question. As to who moved the body, did God move Jesus' body? Or man? Mary Magdalene thinks man or men moved the body. What type of men? Mary. Friends? Enemies? Mary Magdalene thinks enemies. Enemies have come and taken the body of Jesus as grave robbers. Claudius would, a few years later, though not in response to this event, I don't think, prescribe the death penalty for grave robbers. It, it happened in those days. Mary makes this point repeatedly. She thinks it was grave robbers. Verse 2, they have taken, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. Words to Peter and John. Words to the two angels in verse 13. They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid them. Words to the gardener in verse 15. She supposes him to be the gardener. We know different. Verse 15 says, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now there is another party concerned about grave robbers in connection with Christ's tomb and besides Mary Magdalene. This other party was afraid that a different side would steal Jesus' body or rob his grave. Namely, his disciples. That is, the chief priests and Pharisees and elders also thought of grave robbers and that the other side were likely to steal him. And of the four gospel accounts, it's Matthew that speaks most of this. On the Saturday, before Christ's body went missing, they appealed, they expressed their concern to Pontius Pilate. Matthew 27, verse 64. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. They were concerned about that on the Saturday, and they uttered those concerns to Pontius Pilate. Grave robbers, the other side are going to do it. And then on the Sunday, after Christ's body went missing, they instructed the soldiers who had been guarding his tomb. Matthew 28, verse 13, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, Pontius Pilate, we, Jewish chief priests and elders, will persuade him and make you safe. So these watchmen and guards took the bride money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. They were concerned. Grave robbers. Mary thought, yes, grave robbers, but not our side. The enemies have come and stolen his body. And at this point, this particular issue, and at this time, the faith of godly Mary Magdalene was weak because she wasn't thinking about God's mighty acts or the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah and his salvation 
or Jesus' own predictions of his resurrection. Now, she wasn't the only one who wasn't thinking of these things, but it's true to point out, not that we would have done any better, that her faith at this time and in this regard was weak. In John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene's love for Jesus is stronger than her faith in Jesus' resurrection, so to speak. They both come from the Holy Spirit, and it's strange to understand how one could be there. She shows great love, but not faith, because there were weaknesses in her understanding. It was love for Jesus, which set her running off to Peter and John in verse 2, and it was love that produced her many tears that are mentioned in verses 11, 13, and 15, and remarked upon by the angels and even Jesus Christ himself. That's a work of grace and highly commendable, and we'll say more about Mary's love next week. But love, wonderful as it is, didn't enable Mary Magdalene to understand the empty tomb in our text. For that, faith is needed. And Mary here struggling with admittedly a strange and even unique event. All she can think of when she sees the empty tomb is man and grave robbers. But next week, we're going to see her, Lord willing, in a better light. Which brings us to Peter. Now, there are some who interpret Peter and John in our text symbolically. Let me explain. They believe that these two men symbolize Jewish Christianity and Gentile Christianity. That Peter symbolizes Jewish Christianity and John, Gentile Christianity. So the running of these men, they're stooping, they're looking, they're responding. We're to see them as images and pictures of Jewish Christianity on the one hand and Gentile Christianity on the other. So both Jewish and Gentile Christianity, as it were, run to the Lord's empty tomb. The believing Jews, Peter, see Christ's grave clothes first. And the believing Gentiles, John, grasp more fully their significance, being possessed of a stronger faith. So runs the interpretation, the symbolic one. There are, of course, many fatal problems with this. Usually the claim is that Paul, not John, symbolizes Gentile Christianity. And now you can have your cake and eat it. Paul, he represents Gentile Christianity. And John represents, I mean, why? Where is this coming from? And if John represents Gentile Christianity, did Gentile Christianity really get to Christ's grave first? Huh? And Scripture nowhere tells us that John represents Gentile Christianity. It's just a fanciful notion. John 20 isn't presenting Peter and John in and around the empty tomb doing things symbolical of Jewish Christianity or Gentile Christianity or Ethiopian Christianity or Chinese Christianity or any such nonsense as that. John 20 is simply narrating the facts. And here they are. Peter and John, listen to Mary Magdalene's report. The grave's empty. They've taken away the Lord. I don't know where they've brought him. Peter and John head off to the sepulchre together and they break into a run with John going faster than Peter and getting there first. 
Some people reckon that this proves that John is younger than Peter, though it doesn't. It certainly proves, though, that he was faster than Peter. On reaching the tomb, the two disciples act true to their own character, which can be understood from New Testament scriptures. John peers down and into the sepulchre. He sees the linen clothes, but not the napkin or face cloth. And then being more diffident, hesitant, he doesn't go in. Peter suffers from no such inhibitions. When he reaches the tomb, he just enters immediately. Now, there's nothing to do with Jewish Christianity or Gentile Christianity. And none of that. But this brings up the issue of Christ's burial clothes, which deserves some explanation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke teach us that Joseph of Arimathea took Christ's body down from the cross and wrapped it or rolled it or wound it round. This is the idea of the verbs that are used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Wrapped that body round, rolled it, wound it up with new, clean, and a linen cloth. A new, clean linen cloth. Now, if it's new, clean, and it's made of linen. So Christ's body comes down. They take it in the cloth and wrap it or roll it in a cloth made of linen, singular. And then, evidently, when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who helped him, when they get to Christ's tomb, evidently, the linen cloth, singular, was torn into linen cloths, plural, or swathes. One big cloth wrapped upon, wrapped around Jesus, and then it's torn up into swathes, plural. With these swathes, or strips, Christ's body was bound limb by limb, so you work with the arm and you work with the legs individually, and then doubtless between layers were added the myrrh and the aloes, the precious spices that give a sweet aroma designed to mask the awful putrefaction of death. Christ's head was wrapped in a separate napkin or face cloth. And so it is that John writes, John 19, verse 40, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus and wound it or bound it in linen clothes, plural, not one big linen cloth, it has been broken down into strips with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. The spices are specified in verse 39 as a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Then chapter 20 verses 5 through 7. Listen out for the grave garments here. John stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes, plural, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and saith the linen clothes, the third reference to them in the plural. He saith the linen clothes lie, and the napkin or face cloth that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, fourth plural reference, but the napkin was wrapped together in a place by itself. Now I have taken the time of explaining that in part so that we are now in a position to analyze briefly and biblically the Turin Shroud. The Turin Shroud 
has been involved as a center of pilgrimage, superstition, and the money grubbing of the false church. What you ask is the Turin shroud. Well, a shroud is a burial cloth. This particular burial cloth was made of linen. So that, that at least is right. Its dimensions 4.4 meters by 1.1 meters. And this burial cloth bears the negative image of a man. And some say that man is Jesus Christ. And it's called the Turin Shroud because it has been kept in the Roman Catholic Cathedral of Turin in northwest Italy since 1578. Turin, the Turin Shroud, a burial garment, 4.4 meters by 1.1 meters with an image of a man, and they say, that's Jesus. That's what the Turin Shroud is. The Turin Shroud, according to extant records, was first mentioned in 1354. The local bishop denounced it as a fraud in 1389 after an investigation exposed the artist who painted it and the man had confessed his sin. In 1988, it was radiocarbonated, this Turin Shroud, as from 1260, thereabouts, to 1390. So the radiocarbon dating said the Turin Shroud is about 700 years old. Not 2,000 years old, which it would have to be, but 700 years old. And it's worthwhile pointing out that at one time there were probably over 40 shrouds supposedly having wrapped Jesus in his tomb, over 40 crowds, shrouds circulating throughout Europe. And this just happened to be the most convincing fraud. They say these things just to fill out the picture regarding this Turin Shroud, but you don't even have to remember any of those people, places, events, or tests. I'm going to give you three easy biblical arguments against the Turin Shroud from our text. We don't have to rely on carbon dating. Number one, the Turin Shroud is... One big burial cloth. Ah, now I understand why he explained some of those things earlier. One big burial cloth. 1.1 meter wide, something like that. Significantly more than twice my height. I can't even reach up to 4.4 meters. And that's why the, the shroud is sort of doubled up, up on one side, and then the other side is sort of front and back of a human body. The Turin shroud is one shroud. But we read four times that Christ was wrapped in many linen cloths or strips or swathes. Again, chapter 19, verse 40, they wound it in linen clothes. Linen clothes, 20, verse 5. Linen clothes, 20, verse 6. Linen clothes, 20, verse 7. That's it. Blown out of the water. The real Jesus was wrapped in a burial shroud that consisted of strips and swathes, many of them. Therefore, anything that comes about 1,300 years later, and that's one big garment, is biblically and very obviously false. Huh? Argument number two, Jesus Christ was buried with a, in the tomb with a separate napkin or face cloth. Chapter 20, verse 7, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, plural, but wrapped together in a place by itself. The napkin, 
It's going to have, if anything has an impress of his face, it's going to be the napkin around his head. But the Turin Shroud has the image of Christ's face, this is the pretense, on the one huge sheet that goes sort of front and back of a human being. Whereas we know from the scriptures that Christ's head was wrapped in a smaller napkin. That's argument number two. Argument number three, there was no imprint, even on Christ's true burial clothes. Chapter 20, verse 6 says, Simon Peter saith the, the linen clothes lying. Verse 7, there is the napkin about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. It wasn't the case that Peter and then John saw the linen clothes and said, look at this, look at this. There's an imprint of Jesus' body. And look, there's a face and there's a picture of his eyes. You can see his eyes and you can see his beard. They just saw the clothes. Nothing imprinted, even on the real clothes. So much for the two inch ride. What then was Peter thinking of in that empty tomb if he wasn't boggling at the burial clothes with the strange markings on them that would later be the Turin Shroud. What was he thinking of? He was thinking this. Mary Magdalene reckons grave robbers, but now that we're in the tomb, this sure doesn't look like the work of grave robbers. Number one, money. Linen, in those days especially, was costly. The spices including especially the myrrh, was very, very costly. And yet the grave robbers have come in, they haven't taken the linen, and they haven't taken the spices. Why would you do that? Number two, time. Grave robbers, ordinarily, and like all thieves, don't linger on the scene of the crime. Get in, do your job, get out. Why then would grave diggers, grave, not grave diggers, grave robbers, have taken the time to strip Christ of his burial clothes first before leaving with his body? By the way, those who know about myrrh say that the myrrh is very, very sticky and it would have stuck like pitch to Christ's body seeping through the, the, the strips and so forth and how are you going to take the time to prize all that off? Why not simply grab Christ's body in the grave crows and scarper immediately? That's what any sensible person would do. It's quicker and then you have the garments and some of this myrrh which you could use and make money from. Besides the money and the time, there is the tidiness of the scene. Even if grave robbers decided for some reason to take the time to strip Christ of his grave clothes and decided to, for some reason, to leave the valuable linen strips and the spices why did they leave everything so orderly? You've probably seen pictures of a room that's been ransacked. Somebody's coming in to steal and they pull out drawers and they're looking for, and they leave the place a complete shambles. That's not the way it is here. Simon Peter, following John, comes into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together or folded together in a place by itself. Strange, considerate, thoughtful, house-trained grave robbers. <clears throat> and then there's a fourth matter, the shape of the linen clothes. Now we know that Christ's body was resurrected. Jesus Christ was hardly raised from the dead 
sort of as if life comes back to that body wrapped in the, in the, in the strips. He was hardly raised from the dead to undo his grave clothes. He's not like peeling them off once he's back from the dead, inside the grave clothes. I believe that Jesus Christ simply disappeared from under the linen grave clothes. There was a body, a dead body, wrapped with all these strips, with the spices upon them, and Jesus' body, in a moment, disappeared, leaving the strips around his body, saturated and soaked in the spices, maintaining basically the same shape as if they would have had Jesus still occupied the swathes. And so I say, Peter would have seen the grave clothes in his shape. And he would have wondered how the grave robbers could have taken Jesus Christ out of those grave clothes with the linen strips in the shape in which he could currently see them. Grave robbers, very strange grave robbers. They're not concerned with the value of some of the artifacts in that tomb. They're taking all sorts of time, lingering on the scene of their crime. They're very tidy grave robbers. And somehow or other they manage to preserve the shape of the linen clothes. It doesn't look like grave robbers. Now turn with me to Luke 24, verse 12. Luke 24, verse 12. This is Luke's must, much short, shorter, abbreviated version of our text in John 20. We read, Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. That is, here's Peter, and he's wondering to himself, this doesn't look like grave robbers. Mary Magdalene's idea. This doesn't look like the work of man at all. God seems to have done something marvelous. But he's not a hundred percent sure. He's wondering and he's marveling at it. There's something strange and mysterious that I cannot explain by ordinary human earthly means. This is a marvel. But he doesn't voice his thoughts because he's not totally sure. And so Luke 4, 24 verse 12 says he wonders in himself. He's thinking, not speaking. He's wondering in himself. This is marvel. I cannot make sense of this. This looks to me as if God is doing something. But I'm just not sure. And so we move from Mary Magdalene grave robbers, and Peter wondering in himself to John. John 20, verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, the one which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. What did he see? The previous verses tell us. He saw the linen strips, plural, in the shape of Jesus' body. He saw the face cloth all neat and tidily rolled up and sitting by itself. Just like Peter. But whereas Peter merely wondered in himself, we read that John went further. He believed. John believed. And if you ask, well, what did he believe? We note that this was not the first exercise in John of saving faith. He was already a believer for years, just like Mary Magdalene and Peter. 
When it says that John believed, it does not mean, ah, Mary Magdalene was right. Jesus' body really has gone. True. And she was right, his body has been stolen. False, his body hasn't been stolen. John didn't believe that. When it says that John believed, it means John believed the crucial event in the latter chapters of the four gospel accounts. John believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead bodily by God. Mary Magdalene at this stage hadn't got that. Peter was closer, but John believed it by the grace of God. And if you ask, he believed it on what grounds? We're told that he did not believe it on the basis of Scripture, which here means what we call the Old Testament. Verse 9, For as yet they, Peter and John, but here we're focusing on John, as yet John knew not the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. John was not thinking, here's this specific text, like Jonah chapter 1 or Psalm 16. Or here's this theological idea in the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to die. And yet over here in Psalm 110, we see him seated upon a throne. And for that to happen, he has to rise again from the dead. John didn't understand the Old Testament scriptures in this regard. And I believe this means too that John did not either understand at this stage Jesus' own predictions that he would rise from the dead. John, we are told, specifically in our text, believed that Jesus was risen from the dead, not on the basis of Scripture, not on the basis of Christ's predictions, but he believed on the basis of what he had just witnessed. Because what was in that empty tomb was a revelation of God to him. The tomb is empty, no body. Here are the grave clothes. Look at the shape of them. Here is the face cloth rolled up and all tidy by itself. Grave robbers didn't do this. Man didn't do this. God did this. God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It could really only mean one thing. That is what the text is saying. John went in and he saw and believed. He believed the resurrection of Christ on the basis of what he saw in that cave. And the order here is important. This is not the order of John's thoughts. John was not thinking like this. I read in my devotions this morning from Psalm 16 that the Messiah is going to be raised from the dead. I've already confessed that Jesus is the Christ. Therefore, I expect him to be raised. It wasn't scripture first, and then I'm expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead. Never mind scripture first, and then I'm going to manufacture or deceive myself into thinking that he's raised from the dead. The order of John's thinking is this. Here's John on, in Passion Week when Christ was crucified on that Sabbath and even that Sunday morning, he did not expect Jesus to be raised from the dead at all. And he didn't expect this because he didn't understand at this point the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. And when Jesus had earlier said that I'm going to be raised from the dead on the third day, a sort of fog descended in his mind, as often we have with the disciples, and he didn't know what he was talking about. It didn't fit, didn't make sense. It just never registered. He didn't expect the resurrection of the dead. Then he comes to the empty tomb, sees the linen strips and the face cloth, and believes on the basis of what he has seen, Jesus has risen from the dead. Only later will he come to understand this is actually what the Old Testament scriptures have predicted all along. And you know what? Jesus had predicted he would rise from the dead on the third day and somehow or other this is mysteriously kept from him and all of the other disciples john 2 verse 22 when therefore jesus was risen from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them 
destroy this temple, my own body, and in three days I will raise it up. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this unto them, and then they believed the scripture in the Old Testament and the word which Jesus had said. This means that among the 11 disciples, Judas now left the scene, among the 11 disciples, John, the beloved disciple, was the first to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would tell you who the last to believe among the disciples of Jesus Christ was, but I'll let you work that out yourself. And if you don't, it'll crop up in a later sermon. John was the first to believe Jesus' resurrection from the dead. The rest would believe later. And this, sticking to the theme of order, was the first Lord's Day. The day in which the Lord himself was raised from the dead. And, I use a little bit of calculation here, there have been over 100,000 Lord's Days since then, all of which have commemorated this blessed day spoken of in John 20, including here and now, this Lord's Day in this place. And Jesus the Lord is Lord also of the Sabbath, and he's changing it from the seventh day to the first day. In this empty tomb of Christ, a sign of his resurrection that day, much more could be said about this, but we're running out of time, was a seal upon his atoning sacrifice on the cross for all of his people. A proof God accepts Christ's atonement. God is pleased with the suffering of his son in the place of all of his people. And God is showing this by raising him from the dead. Proving also thereby Jesus' deity and messianic office. And John tells us, verse 31, all these things are written, including our text tonight, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of of the living God. And that believing, ye might have life through his name. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, enable us to see the wonderful truth of Christ's resurrection, to believe this, to apply this to our own regeneration, sanctification, our own bodily resurrection on the last day. Ground us deeply in these facts. Comfort us with the truth of his power over death and help us, Lord God, to understand the last couple of chapters of John that we may be wrapped in this, in our souls, with this great mystery and wonder. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.